1978 to 1999, I served as the chief executioner. I performed 62 executioners in the 17 years. People that recommend the death penalty, the jury, the judge, if they had to perform the execution, I think that they would in light a different story on giving the death penalty to anyone. The United States is the last country in the developed West to execute criminals. About 50% of Americans are for the death penalty and 50% against it. Our capital punishment system is flawed. This is not a matter of vengeance. It's a matter of justice. The death penalty, we believe, serves as a deterrent. Capital punishment is tainted by racial disparity. Having my father's killers executed did not bring me a sense of closure. Is it to restore society or is it to punish? If you take a life, shouldn't your life be taken? Justice is about us as a society. Nineteen eighty two was my first execution. I was a correctional officer. One of my main jobs were to save my lives. So when it came down to execution, I had to transform myself into a person that would take a life. Jerry Gibbons was appointed executioner in 1977 when the United States reinstated the death penalty. He grew up in the housing projects of Richmond, Virginia, and remembers one tragic night at a party. When I was a teenager, I witnessed a young lady uh, being shot to death right before my eyes. I wanted revenge for the young lady because she was innocent. I was totally for the death penalty. My thing is that uh, if a person take the a life of another person, then that person's life should be taken, and that's what I believe. Jerry received training to operate the electric chair and later to administer lethal injections. He became chief executioner in 1982. I would say my team members take pride in their work, their preparations, uh, getting this person ready for his next step in life. Prepare him to just to see his kids for the last time, uh, a last kiss of his mother or sister, or even his wife or daughter. We all are human, you know, and this is one human that had made a mistake. And uh, we had to carry out the orders. Outside of his team of eight, Jerry told no one about his work as an executioner, not even his wife. We would keep it a secret. And I kept it a secret from my, my family. Since 1977, he and other executioners across the United States have put over 1,460 people to death. It's a punishment that's supposed to be reserved for the worst of the worst. It was a gorgeous day. It was a beautiful April morning. We met some friends in, in Boston. 23,000 runners and half a million spectators gathered for the Boston Marathon. Karen Brissard, her husband and daughter, were cheering a friend over the finish line. We were there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes all excited with the crowd, watching everybody come through, and just suddenly 
It was this incredibly loud explosion. There were seven of us there. Six of us were injured. One of our dear friends lost both of her legs that day. I knew that my husband was pretty badly injured. My daughter had shrapnel from her hips to her feet. And I had shrapnel in both of my legs. The two blasts injured over 260 people and killed three, including Crystal Campbell, Lingzi Liu, and eight-year-old Martin Richard. Police pursued two brothers in a dramatic manhunt. Twenty-six-year-old Tamerlan Zarnaev was killed in a shootout. A day later, Police captured the younger brother, Zokar, alive. Over the next few months, Karen, Ron, and their daughter, like many of the bombing victims, had to undergo multiple surgeries. I'm going to try to not let this change who I am. I'm not going to let this prevent me from living the life that I want to live. I'm not going to be afraid. Later that summer, Karen traveled from her home in New Hampshire to Boston for Zarnayev's arraignment at the federal court. We were all seated together and he walked out. He didn't look at any of us, but his hand was obviously injured. And my immediate response was, I hope that hurts. I hope it's painful. That was not like me. And the recognition of that about me was scary because it isn't who I am. Zarnaev pled not guilty to all 30 counts, 17 punishable by death. The federal prosecutor asked victims if the U.S. should seek the death penalty. I don't know. I, um, I don't know. I don't know what justice is. I thought I knew. Terrorist acts are rare. Much more common are the murders and other violent acts that happen every day across the United States. In Philadelphia, Shannon Schieber was finishing her first year of graduate school. She had been up studying. It was a early Thursday morning. Her final exam was Friday morning. About 2 o'clock in the morning, she was preparing to take a bath. The assailant who, uh, who attacked her, he pried open her sliding door. She screamed for help as she was being attacked. The next door neighbor heard that. He called 911. He told them that he heard his neighbor, Shannon, screamed for help and he heard like a choking sound. The police arrived within 20 minutes. They knocked on the door, but no one answered. The next day, when Shannon didn't show up for a lunch date with her brother, Sean, he drove to her apartment building. One of Shannon's neighbors came down and, and answered the door, and Sean said, I'm trying to reach my sister, or I can't reach her. The guy just went pale. They said, oh my God, I called the police last night. And they went running up the steps. They broke uh, open her door, 
uh, and she was laying uh, naked on her bed. By the time we got to Philadelphia, though, the police were swarming around the apartment building, and, and they let us know immediately that she had been attacked and, and that uh, she had been murdered. We were beginning to, to face the fact that part of us had died. And I mean, it, it, it hit us very quickly. I just remember saying a whole lot of prayers that we'd be able together to get through this. That weekend, they attended Mass. When we got to the Lord's Prayer, saying the Lord's Prayer out loud was a real confrontation for me. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I had to abandon something I had been saying, often probably thoughtlessly, thousands of times over my, over my life. And if anyone would have asked us, well, what would you want to do if you, if you ever found who did this? I, I just, oh, I'd be so angry. I wanted, I'd want him dead too, maybe. I, I don't know. I've never had this happen. It was just so painful. Eight days later, the Shebers buried their 23-year-old daughter. What does society do when someone commits a horrific act of violence? For centuries, seeking justice was a community affair. And disproportionate blame fell on the poor, mentally disabled, and people of color. In the 1800s, some capital offenses were targeted specifically at slaves, establishing a racial bias that continues today. Executions reached a historic peak in the 1930s, averaging 167 per year. But then, in 1936, a gruesome execution caught the attention of the media. On August 14th, in Owensboro, Kentucky, Rainy Bethia was publicly hanged by a white sheriff. Many thought Bethia was innocent. One New York Times reporter wrote, 10,000 white persons, some jeering and others festive, saw a prayerful black man put to death today on Davies County's pit and gallows. The outcry over Rainy Bethia's hanging did not put an end to capital punishment. Instead, it drove executions behind prison walls out of public view. State officials built death houses and institutionalized the practice. It's a death by formula. It's a scripted death. In the beginning, it was hanging. It was not only hanging, but it was public. And so you see the crowds coming and bringing a picnic lunch and celebrating. Then we moved from hanging to the electric chair. And then we began to have the horror stories that happened out of the electric chair. And then there's been the move to lethal injection. And lethal injection, it's like we're going medicinal so that we'll just be putting them to sleep. But not everyone agrees. The idea that they should go out in an opiate haze, that it should be a pleasant death, is absolutely perverse. The debate about the death penalty has become increasingly polarized and politicized. We want a system that's fair. We want a system that respects the dignity of, of human beings. The idea that we were executing innocent people was terrifying, and there was just no way that we hadn't and that we weren't. Some people kill with an attitude so callous, heinous, sadistic, that they have forfeited their right to live. I believe in a deterrent of one. And that is, 
when we execute this person, we know he will never kill again. Why is it that the death penalty really comes down to, in many cases, just where you live, who your DA is? We can all recognize injustice when we see it. It's people not being treated fairly. It's people not getting a fair shot. You can be critical of the death penalty. You can be critical of the idea that the government has the right to kill and also hold compassion and concern for victims. Maybe in some books of justice, the person for this act deserves to die, but do we as a society deserve to kill them? Today, capital punishment largely falls to the state in which the crime was committed. And laws and methods vary widely. Most states use lethal injection, but some still use gas chambers, the electric chair, hanging, and firing squads. Carrying out the death penalty is entrusted to specially trained guards like Jerry Givens. Of the 62 executions that Jerry's conducted, 37 were by electrocution and 25 by lethal injection. Lethal injection is considered the more humane form, but for Jerry, it made the job of killing another person a lot tougher. When you talk about execution and electrocution, is a button you push, and once you push the button, the current flows in and the current, the current comes out. And that's all I had to do was to push a button. But when it come down to death by lethal injection, you have seven tubes of chemicals. You have four flushes and three deadly chemicals that is inserted into this man. And myself as the executioner, I'm at the end of each syringe. I'm pushing the poison down the tube into the body. So I'm more attached to this person than it is pushing a button and releasing it and let the current flow by itself. 15 days prior to an execution, the condemned would be moved to the death chamber where Jerry and his team worked. All nine of us were executioners, and we perfect a good execution. That's what we withstood by. The preparation was mental as well as physical. We practice and practice and practice prior to the execution. Each of us knew our jobs, our assignment, and we never allow ourselves to get that close to anyone, you know. We train for that. We train this way. You don't get that close to them. The day of the execution, 24 hours prior to that, we, we have a, a call a death watch. A guy will act differently because he knew that this is the last everything. This is the cell where the condemned stays. This is where the uh, warden read his death warrant his clergy person sit with him. During this course of the day, the condemned is given a shower, his last meal, his last visitations. By six o'clock, our preparations will start until uh, the inmate is placed to death. At home in New Hampshire, Karen and her family were slowly recovering from their injuries. It's not so much the loss of physical abilities, things like the loss of, especially for me, my rose-colored glasses, you know, um, just a reality. Relationships 
with people are different. Things are not the same. And even with Ron and I, it's different. He's working through things and I'm working through things and... It had been six months since the bombing and Karen had not yet seen her good friend Celeste, who was with them at the finish line and lost both her legs. In the beginning, initially, I, I couldn't bring myself to be with Phil. Because I felt guilty. Celeste and 16 others lost limbs that day. Ron was one of the lucky ones. Doctors were able to save his leg. But the trauma and pain still lingered. We're going to have to work for a long time to get to the new normal, whatever that's going to be. After months of deliberation, Attorney General Eric Holder announced the U.S. would seek the death penalty. The defense will argue that Zokar was pressured into it by his older brother, that he was a popular, well-liked college kid led astray. You know, he's got to be held responsible, and I agree, and I, and I do believe that. But I also think he's 19. He's just a kid. It's stupid. I don't know. Karen's son was the same age as Okar. It didn't seem like such a hard decision when it was abstract. You know, I've got family and friends who are very religious and don't believe in it. And then I have others who just say it's the right thing to do. They're so sure. I don't know that it's right for me to make that decision to take someone else's life. In Philadelphia, Shannon's killer was still on the loose. The Shebers pressed for answers, but the police had none. It's just like you're in a, in a coma. I mean, you're just like walking through something, but you, you don't know exactly how you're going to deal with it. How am I ever, ever going to get through this? Just this tremendous sense of loss. And, you know, for some time I could visualize Shannon kind of walking through a door, just walking in the house and walking through a door, saying, hi, Da, and, and she called me Da. She was so kind and generous and loving and helpful. She always would come to us and say, Mom and Dad, I have to make a difference. Shannon was uh, many, many things. She had a tremendous appetite for learning. Everybody loved Shannon. Everybody loved her. She was an extremely loving daughter. In their grief, Vicki and Syl turned to each other and reached out for support. This takes time. It doesn't, you know, everybody goes down a different path and a different timeline to this journey toward healing. They began attending support meetings for families of murder victims. There, they saw the devastating toll of sorrow and anger. The father of one of the murdered daughters we know well took his first drink and he never stopped for a year and he eventually lost his job and a marriage. Bud Welch's daughter was one of 166 people killed in the Timothy McVeigh bombing of Oklahoma City. One night, about a year later, he uh, woke up in the morning and he had this dream. And his daughter, Julie, was there telling him, Dad, Dad, he murdered me. Are you going to let him murder our whole family? The Shebers also saw the high price people paid for putting their lives on hold as they waited for an execution. 
we started finding out what murder victims' families go through if you decide to say, look it, I want that man executed. It would take 15, 20 years as much uh, longer for it actually to happen. And we just saw the effects that this had on these family members. We saw it destroying their lives. During his years serving as Virginia's chief executioner, Jerry would hear inmates swear they were innocent. When you hear a person going to his deathbed, sticking out that he was innocent to the last syringe going to his body, he's sticking out that he was innocent on his last words, his last breath. It gave me something to think about as the executioner and it placed some doubt there. There was one young man in particular, Earl Washington Jr. He was trying to tell society back then that he was innocent, but yet uh, no one really paid no attention to him. In 1983, Earl was arrested in Culpeper, Virginia, and brought in for questioning. He thought it was for a burglary he had committed. They said, I answer all the questions they asked about different crimes. And up, they said that I said I did them. And they said, I know I was going to court for Captain Mur rape and murder, which is called Captain Murder, which could carry the death penalty. After intense questioning, police officers extracted a confession from Earl for the brutal rape and stabbing murder of a 19-year-old mother of three. At his trial, experts testified that Earl had an IQ of only 69 and was extremely suggestible, casting doubt on his confession. Despite inconclusive evidence, the jury found Earl guilty and the judge sentenced him to death. He was taken to Mecklenburg, a supermax prison in Virginia. He was scared to death. He was timid. He didn't want to come out of his cell. He's mentally retarded. He, he couldn't read. He couldn't write. I walked him into the cell, and if he needed anything, bang on the door, I'll come and see what you want. That was Earl the whole time he was on the road. He was scared and timid. Hardest thing was for me when my mom and daddy came to see me at 500 Spring Street. And most people said they hate to see their mama cry, which I did. Two weeks before Earl's date of execution, the guards came to transport him to the death house in Richmond. They chained him up put him in a waist chain, handcuffed shackles, and they walked him out, literally drug him out. And meanwhile, everybody's banging on the doors. They're, they're, they're cussing the guards. Joe reached out to his caseworker, Marie Deans, to see if anything could be done. I called Marie in a panic. I said, I don't, I don't know if this guy did it or not, but I don't think he did. I don't think this guy knows what's going on. When Earl arrived at the death house, he was handed over to Jerry. I received Earl from Mecklenburg. And when he came in, I gave him, carried him to the infirmary. He was given a complete physical. At that time, we only had death by electrocution, the chair. So he didn't have a choice. You can hear you can, you can the electricity running through the chair humming. Every day for the whole week I was there. They said they were getting it ready for me. I laughed at them. When that day came, I said, well, good Lord, want me to go, I'll go, I guess. If you don't, I ain't going nowhere. Working day and night, Joe and Marie secured a rare stay of execution. Marie was convinced that Earl had been pressured into falsely confessing. My work with mentally retarded defendants made me know that this was a 
what we would call a coerced confession, whether it was coerced psychologically or, or in some other way. Did you kill that woman? No, sir. But you told the police that you did. Yes, sir. Why did you tell the police that you did it? I don't know. You don't know? No, sir. Did you understand then that you were being accused of a murder? No, sir. You didn't understand that? No, sir. New DNA tests proved Earl was not the murderer. He was moved off death row, but he remained in prison. Virginia law at the time did not allow the introduction of new evidence. Jerry heard little about what happened to Earl. His focus was on preparing for the next execution. One year after the Boston Marathon bombing, a memorial service brought everyone together for the first time. When we walked down the road to the sites, Ron and I and Christara stopped at each site and said a prayer. A week later, Karen and Ron united with survivors at the 2014 Boston Marathon. They cheered their friend Celeste in a symbolic run across the finish line. I am angry at what he did. And when I see my friends and they struggle and I see other survivors I don't want my decision to be based on how angry I get in those instances. That fall, Judge O'Toole announced the trial would be held in Boston. We have two choices. We can either let him stay alive and have his interaction and have his joys um, or put him to death and have that be the end of it. They don't get to see their little boy playing baseball anymore or reading him a story at night. And this young man is in jail and he's reading stories that he likes. He's got books available to him that he enjoys or he meets with his sisters and gets to see pictures of their children growing up. and. I just don't think it's fair that they have had their, their joys taken away from them and he still is able to experience that. Karen decided to attend the trial. I want to be there to see justice. In Philadelphia, nearly four years after Vicki and Sill's daughter Shannon was murdered, the police got a lead. In 2001, there had been a series of assaults started taking place out in Fort Collins, Colorado. They put out a, a report to police agencies all across the United States. So they sent DNA from Shannon's case to Fort Collins. The DNA was a match. The suspect was married and employed at an Air Force base. So about eight o'clock that night, 23rd day of April, uh, 2002, this fellow and his wife walked into the police station. And by midnight that night, they had a full confession for the dozen different cases. The man they arrested was 29-year-old Troy Graves. Philadelphia's elusive Center City rapist. Graves was accused of multiple counts of sexual assault and one count of murder in the death of Shannon Sheber. The prosecutor was District Attorney Lynn Abraham. The prosecutor in the city of Philadelphia, who is known as a pretty deadly DA, in other words, she put more people on death row 
than uh, uh, any other prosecutor in Pennsylvania and probably any a large number around the country. Troy Graves was found guilty and the district attorney wanted the death penalty, but the Shebers did not. It meant they would have to fight for the life of their daughter's killer. We had said to each other and consulted with our very large families that what would we do if they ever caught him? Well, we would stick to our principles. You know, if someone was going to want him put to death, we were going to argue for life without the possibility of parole. The district attorney voiced her disagreement and outrage. The district attorney there became very, very upset, and she became very public with her, with her opinion. And she said, I don't care what the Shebers said. The death penalty was the appropriate sentence for their daughter's murder. Why would they not want it? For Vicki and Syl, the answer was clear. We just can't let this anger, this natural human anger and pain overwhelm us and, and make us so vengeful and, and hateful because it would just, over time, destroy us. And we knew that. Vicki and Syl received piles of hate mail, accusing them of not loving their daughter. You know, if you can't stand by your principles when it's difficult, they're not your principles. Several years passed before Jerry learned that Earl Washington was not guilty. It, it had to be like 15 or 20 executions after Earl was released uh, from death row that I found out that he was, he was innocent. I said, wow, that's, that's, that's close calling, you know. He came within days and I would have executed an innocent person. Our criminal justice system is supposed to be the best in the world. I don't think we'd make those mistakes, but yet when you see a person like Earl Washington, something happened there. In the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, Congress passed legislation to escalate death sentences. The result was a dramatic increase in executions. By 1999, Jerry was putting to death more than one person per month. The death certificate reads, uh, death by uh, homicide. Uh, you know, it don't make sense. I don't want to be considered as a person that's committed a homicide, but that's what it reads. After 62 executions, the only killer that I could see was myself, and I refused to look into the mirror. He nearly took the life of Earl Washington and couldn't help but wonder if there were others. Research now shows that for every nine executions, there is one inmate found innocent and exonerated. One out of 10 who might have been mistakenly put to death. Nearly two years after the bombing, the trial was about to begin. Karen left her home in New Hampshire early to arrive for the opening statements. It was the first time she had seen Tsarnaev since the arraignment. Inside the courtroom, Karen and the other survivors were seated just 20 feet away. He refused to look at them. The defense team would make the case that Zokar Zarnayev was unduly influenced by his older brother. The prosecutors would argue that he was fully responsible for his actions. Many victims shared their experiences, including the father of eight-year-old Martin, who described having to choose between comforting his dying son and saving his daughter. Over the next four weeks, Karen and other survivors relived the horror of the bombing. They reached out to each other for support. Coming to court, it was amazing how 
quickly and how close we all got. It was, we're like a family. But her husband, Ron, stayed away. Since the bombing, Ron has changed. It's a hard thing to watch the man that you love struggle so desperately and be so angry. He's just not the same as he was before. A federal jury convicted Jahar Sarnayev on all 30 counts he was facing for the Boston Marathon bombing. In just 11 hours, the jury found Sarnayev guilty of all charges. Now they would decide if he should be put to death. The survivors were divided. Karen's friend Celeste was for a death sentence. The Richards, not wanting to go through years of appeals, had decided against it. It's a long, tough process to really examine why you feel what you feel. You really have to look at yourself pretty hard to decide. As soon as Vicki and Syl learned the identity of the man who raped and murdered their daughter, Vicki wanted to know more. I want to, I want to know why. I want to understand what he did. Why was this going forward like this? What was going on? Where was his background? I have to talk to his mother. I, I wanted to understand who he was. Vicki located Troy Graves' mother and gave her a call. We were on the phone together for many, many hours and tears, just tears sobbing with each other. I said, but I want you just to understand what you are going through. I want to share with what I'm going through and maybe we can help each other and learn from each other and, and just come to some kind of peace with all this because God, you, you must be going through a terrible time to lost your son, you know? And she says, oh, Mrs. Sheever, I murdered your daughter. Troy Graves' mother blamed herself for her son's actions. And I said, I don't understand. What, what do you say? She said, it got more and more violent in our household. And my kids would come to me and they'd say, please, mommy, let's go. This is a bad, daddy's bad. I was telling them, I can't. I don't have a job. I don't have, you know, an education. I can't support you. Oh my God, how can I be angry? Vicki began meeting with inmates on death row. She discovered a system of victims on all sides. We could just hear Shannon say, Mom and Dad, now that you know about the system, the terrible flaws, the bias, the racial, the geographic bias, the cost issues, they don't get good lawyers, just all the, I could go on and on. Uh, you know, what are you going to do about it? They began advocating across the country and quickly found that many people thought all victims wanted the death penalty. They say, that the reason we have to keep the death penalty here is because that's what murder victims' families want. That's going to give them peace. That's going to give them justice. And, and we come in and say, not quite. We've been through this. <laughs> this isn't the way. If you lose a child, part of you dies. Holy and, heart. And uh, so you have, to, you have to kind of learn to live with this hole in your heart. Either we can continue to dwell on it and, and kind of well up the, the misery and sustain that misery that we, uh, that, that we incurred because of what was going on, uh, or we can, uh, we can try and force things to change to the extent we can. They countered their grief by sharing their story and providing testimony that would influence death penalty legislation Losing a loved one to murder is a tragedy of unimaginable proportions. This all happened... Her testimony years. helped Maryland become the 18th state to repeal capital punishment. I've told my daughter's story now in 22 different states, and I have seen the tremendous effect of this whole system on murder victims' family members. In an ongoing tribute to the memory of their daughter, Vicki and Syl continue their efforts to end the death penalty.
In Boston, nearly three weeks had passed since Sarnayev was found guilty. But the federal jury had yet to make a decision about whether he should be put to death. Karen went to the courthouse nearly every day. Over the course of the trial, she had become one of the main spokespersons and media contacts for the survivors. But for now, there was nothing to do but wait. Suddenly, a text from a clerk inside alerted her that the jury was close to a decision. They're gonna be coming down with a verdict anytime now. I would prefer it be the death penalty just because I think that that's the fair thing, the right thing, as awful as that is. Um, I think it's the, the just thing. So that's what I'm hoping. And we are coming on the air because the jury deciding the fate of Boston Marathon bomber Johar Zarnayev has reached a verdict. They have sentenced him to death. News of the verdict traveled fast. I know that there's still a long road ahead, but right now it feels like we can take a breath and kind of actually breathe again. You know, without even realizing it, you're holding your breath. And once the verdict came in, it was like, okay, now we can we can start from here and go forward. With Sarnev's fate sealed, Karen began the long drive home. I don't think it evens the score. I don't think that it teaches anybody anything. I don't believe that it's going to be a deterrent to the next young man who has anger, but I, I just think that there's nothing, no other choice in my mind that is fair. After 17 years and 62 executions, Jerry's time as executioner came to an abrupt end. In the midst of preparing for another execution, he was subpoenaed by a grand jury and accused of money laundering. Jerry claimed he was innocent, but the court found him guilty. The Sunday after his sentencing, Jerry's long-held secret about his role as executioner became public. They put it in the paper and said the man that carried out execution orders for the state of Virginia was found guilty. Once it was out, I mean, I'm exposed. So I got to come forward. I got to tell my wife, is this in the truth about this? Yeah. Well, I didn't know. No, because I didn't tell you. I didn't want you to have to go through what I have to go through. While Jerry served his time, he learned that Earl Washington received a full pardon and, after 17 years, was finally released from prison. About 4% of the guys that I've executed, they, they stuck out that they were innocent. So, and then after Earl's case, you know, placed doubt there to find out that innocent people were there on death row. After serving his time, Jerry worked hard to rebuild his life. He began speaking out against the death penalty, one of the few executioners to do so. We need to do that. We need to change. I didn't enjoy killing people, so what can we do to prevent these things from happening? Jerry thought often about Earl Washington. If I ever get to see him, I would say, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I'm glad that things didn't go the way they was planned to go. And I'm glad to, to see you on this side because I can't apologize to you after I take your life, you know. After I hit that button, that's it. I'm glad I didn't get the chance to hit that. So I apologize to you for even thinking the way I thought you was guilty. Jerry decided to visit Earl, to talk with him face to face. Mm -hmm. 
Though it had been many years, Jerry and Earl swapped stories and quickly rediscovered a shared past. I hit him one day. I was at Mackenberg then. That was in 85. Okay. I went to Richmond 5 on Swing Street then. Okay. That's where they had the electric chair at then. Yeah. You know, I wonder what, what go, I, you know, went through your mind, yeah, you know, told, knowing that you was innocent. Yeah, I told my mama I hated yeah. the whole world. Yeah. yeah. She said, boy, I didn't raise you up like that. Yeah. I raised you up in the church. I said, I realized that I'm It's a good thing that I didn't kill him, you know, because I don't think I could wear that. He he didn't do anything wrong, you know. So it's it's, it's something that I would have had to face. But to see him crossing that bridge and to meet him and hug him is a, is a good feeling. And if you don't know because you're in my shoes. <laughs>